If you own a snub nose revolver, odds are very good that it's chambered for 38 Special. Revolvers in general may not be nearly as popular as they once were, but the small, lightweight 38 Special snub nose is still one of the best selling handguns on the market. I like the 38 Special, it's an excellent round, but for a snub nose, it's not the best caliber. That title goes to the humble 32. I should probably be more specific because over the years there have been many revolver cartridges that fire a 32 caliber bullet. The 32s I have in mind are not a single cartridge, but a family of four cartridges. 32 short, 32 long, 32 H&R Magnum, and 327 Federal Magnum. 32 short, also known as 32 Smith & Wesson short, or just 32 Smith & Wesson, was introduced way back in 1878 as a black powder cartridge for small concealable revolvers. Today we would consider it underpowered even by pocket pistol standards, but before smokeless powder and 20th century metallurgy you couldn't really expect much from a pocket sized gun, and the 32 short was at least as good as any of its small caliber contemporaries. In 1896 the case of the 32 short was lengthened slightly to create the 32 Smith & Wesson Long. This was the cartridge used for the very first Smith & Wesson hand ejector model, which is the basic design that Smith & Wesson's revolvers are still based on today. Colt also made revolvers for this cartridge, but they called it the 32 Colt New Police. 32 Long has a bit more punch than the 32 Short, but it's still not especially powerful. It's unusually accurate for a handgun cartridge, and some small game hunters have made good use of it with wad cutter bullets or hand loads. Factory 32 long ammo is a bit easier to come by than any of the other 32 revolver calibers, partly because of its popularity in international competitive bullseye shooting. 32 long was fairly common throughout the early 1900s, but that popularity declined as 38 Special became America's favorite revolver cartridge. By the 1980s, it was fading into obscurity, but that didn't stop the revolver manufacturer Harrington and Richardson from trying to bring the 32 back to life. In 1984, H&R teamed up with Federal to launch the 32 H&R Magnum. Based on an elongated 32 long case, the 32 H&R Magnum is capable of much higher velocities. Ballistically, it's often compared to standard pressure 38 Special. Harrington and Richardson went out of business just a couple of years after the release of their 32 Magnum, but by then several other companies had adopted the cartridge for their own revolvers. With the improved ballistics, there was a lot of appeal for a small frame revolver that could hold six rounds of 32 Magnum, where a 38 or 357 only had room for five. The new 32 saw some limited success, but thanks to a declining interest in revolvers in general, it never really caught on. By the early 2000s, there were very few new revolvers being made for 32 H&R Magnum. But the cartridge did have some enthusiastic fans, especially among handloaders. They noticed that the SAMI specs for 32 H&R Magnum were fairly conservative and didn't take full advantage of the case capacity. This eventually led to yet another attempted revival of the 32, this time in 2008 when Ruger and Federal introduced the 327 Federal Magnum. The cartridge case was once again lengthened and the new case capacity allowed for some truly impressive ballistics out of a 32 caliber bullet, even with short barreled revolvers. But even so, a decade after its introduction, 327 Federal Magnum can only at best be described as a mild success. Ruger has been the real champion of this caliber. They've offered several revolvers chambered for it, including the small framed SP-101 and LCR. They've got a seven shot GP-100 and some of their single action models. At one time or another, Smith & Wesson, Taurus, and Charter Arms have all also made 327 Magnums, but they've all been discontinued for quite a while now. Along with a few lever action rifles from Henry Repeating Arms, the 327 Rugers are really the only 32 caliber revolvers in current production that are widely available here in the US. Ammo support is minimal too, with barely a handful of factory loads being produced for the Magnum calibers. And that's really a shame because together these four 32 cartridges offer an incredible amount of versatility. As you might imagine from their shared history, the 32s have what the technology world would call backwards compatibility. A 32 long can also fire 32 shorts. A 32 magnum can fire 32 shorts or longs and a 327 magnum can safely chamber all four. So a 327 gives you the most versatility, but even a 32 Magnum offers some advantages over the more ubiquitous 38 Special. In fact, if we were to overlook the lack of industry support and availability for a minute, the 32 family of cartridges is a much better fit for a small revolver than any other caliber. 
Besides squeezing one more round in the cylinder than a 38 or a 357, the 32s are just a lot more shootable, especially in a lightweight model. I think some of the best 32s ever made were the 32 Magnum Smith & Wesson Airweights and Airlight J-Frames from the late 90s and early 2000s. This is a model 332Ti. It's got an aluminum frame and a titanium alloy cylinder for an unloaded weight of just 11 and a half ounces. That's about the same weight as this model 342PD in 38 Special or the model 43C in 22 Long Rifle. The 38 is pretty obnoxious to shoot even with standard pressure ammo. The 43C is a great shooter, except for the heavier trigger pull you get with the rimfire guns. With the 332, I can load up 32 shorts and it's about the same recoil as the 22. Shooting the more common 32 long ammo feels more or less like shooting a 22 Magnum. And even if I load up full power 32 Magnum self-defense loads, it's still a softer shooting gun than the 38 with any factory load you'll find. This isn't just about comfort. Like I've mentioned several times previously in our pocket pistol series, less recoil almost always results in better shot placement. In the context of self-defense, good shot placement beats good ballistics. With small handguns, we usually have to pick one or the other, but 32s can offer a very nice balance of both mild recoil, and decent ballistics. Felt recoil is always a difficult thing to quantify, but I'm gonna do my best by sharing the results of a timed shooting drill I tried at the range with eight different types of ammo. I used two nearly identical 17 ounce Ruger LCRs, one chambered in 357 Magnum and the other in 327 Magnum. I chose the five x five drill to evaluate the effects of recoil. Normally, the goal of this drill is to fire five rounds into a five inch circle at five yards in under five seconds, starting either from the holster or a low ready position. But for this exercise, the time to the first shot was not important. I was only interested in how quickly I could recover the sights from recoil and fire the next shot. So I attempted the drill four times with each load and for every attempt, I recorded the time between my first and last shots. And here's the average time of my two fastest clean runs from each load. Keep in mind, this is not a perfect numeric representation of the felt recoil from these loads, but it should give you a basic idea of how they compare to each other. The 32 Long and 32 Magnum, for example, are both light recoiling rounds, but in reality, there is probably a slightly bigger difference in felt recoil than these numbers suggest. The Fiocchi Wad Cutter is the absolute lightest recoiling 38 Special commercial load that I'm aware of, and I still shot the drill slower with that than with the 32 Magnum. The 327 American Eagle 85 grain soft point is actually considered a low recoil load for 327, but it's still quite a handful. I think this would be great for a steel gun like the SP-101, but not my favorite load to shoot out of the LCR. I shot the 38 Special Plus P Gold Dot much slower than the 85 grain 327, but I think the actual felt recoil was pretty similar between the two. Shooting the full power 100 grain 327 mag American Eagle out of a 17 ounce revolver is just painful and very loud and not something I would recommend. Even if you're immune to the pain, keeping the muzzle on target is a real challenge with a load like this. And then finally, the 135 grain 357 Magnum Spear Gold Dot is a short barrel load, which is actually quite mild for a 357, but still it sucks to shoot in the LCR and it's every bit as difficult to control as the 327 Magnum. Again, this is not a perfect proportional scale, so take these numbers with a grain of salt. The bottom line is that if you've got a 32 revolver, anything you can fit in the cylinder other than the 327s is gonna have lighter recoil than even the lightest 38 Special. These little guns are actually fun to shoot with 32s. So now let's take a closer look at the terminal ballistics. Unfortunately, the fact that 32s aren't very popular means we have very little information to go on as far as how these calibers compare to others in actual shootings. Even when a 32 does show up in the news or a police report from a self-defense shooting, they often don't even specify whether it was a 32 short or long or magnum or even 32 ACP. I don't like relying on ballistic gel test data without the ability to compare it to what's been observed in the real world but it should still give us a pretty decent idea of what to expect. As with the other calibers I've covered so far in our pocket pistol series, I will be doing some more comprehensive gel tests for the 32s later on. For today, I've just got a quick overview. I fired two rounds of each of the 32 revolver calibers into a single block of gel with our four layer heavy clothing barrier. 
The 32 short 88 grain Remington bullets averaged around eight inches of penetration. They actually made it a couple of inches farther, but there was an unusual amount of bounce back. Either way, they landed well short of the ideal 12 inch minimum. The 32 long wad cutters really surprised me with an average penetration depth of 15 inches. That is roughly the same performance as the Winchester 38 special wad cutters we tested a while back, which is a heavier bullet with more velocity. Full wad cutters are known for having excellent penetration, but this was still unexpected for a load this slow and light. The Black Hills 32 H&R Magnum jacketed hollow points averaged 14.4 inches in gel. Neither of them expanded, but that's not unusual for a small caliber hollow point at this velocity. Finally, the 327 Magnum Spear Gold Dot delivered some harsh recoil, but performed exactly as advertised. Average penetration was 16.1 inches, and both bullets expanded nicely to 0.51 inches. Well, let's see how these results compare to some other calibers. The 32 short obviously doesn't look good compared to much of anything, but the other 32s aren't bad at all. Penetration is more than adequate, and that's the first priority. Expansion is non-existent except for the 327, but even in a 38 plus P, expansion is unreliable with a 2 inch gun. For as little recoil as the 32 long and H&R Magnum deliver, this is impressive ballistic performance. So really, the only catch preventing a 32 from being the ideal caliber for a snub nose is the lack of industry support. Ruger is making the 327 revolvers I mentioned earlier, but if you prefer a Smith, you'll have to hunt one down on the used market and they tend to be pretty rare. The availability and pricing of 32 ammo is kind of mixed. 32 long is the most common and the most affordable, but expect to pay about 30% more than 38 special for everyday target ammo. And there's a similar price jump when you go from 357 to 327 Federal Magnum. 32 H&R Magnum is my favorite of the 32s, but it's also the hardest to come by. Factory target ammo is non-existent. Right now, the only options in that caliber are premium self-defense loads from Federal, Hornady, Black Hills, and Buffalo Boar. Also, keep in mind that the ammo market is slower right now than it was earlier in the decade. If demand were to spike like it has in the past, ammo manufacturers are going to focus on cranking out the most popular products. The more offbeat calibers can become even more scarce during those periods until things cool off a little bit. So for inexperienced or casual shooters or really anyone who only plans to own one snub nose revolver, it's probably best to stick with a more mainstream caliber with better availability and industry support. But if the ammo issues don't bother you, the 32s have a lot to offer. In particular, the Ruger LCR in 327 Magnum is a near perfect all around snub nose revolver. It's light enough to be easy to carry, but it's still got enough heft to be pleasant to shoot for long range sessions. It's an approachable gun for a novice shooter to learn on, and it offers a lot of flexibility for more experienced revolver fans who actually like to shoot their snubbies.